Okay, coming in seems to have stabilized, so let's start the webinar. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Thomas Pettit. I'm the managing editor of Physical Review A, and I'm joined today by uh, Professor Jan Reyes, lead editor and the director at the Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems in Dresden. That's Professor Maciek Levenstein from ICFO in Barcelona and Professor Misha Ivanov from uh, Mohorn Institute in Berlin to talk about their paper, Theory of High Harmonic Generation by Low Frequency Laser Field. Uh, the webinar is in a part of a series that's called PRA Behind the Research. It's the first webinar of that series that you're attending, then you might well ask, uh, why talk about this paper now, uh, more than years after it's been published? And the reason for that is this year marks PRA's 50th anniversary. In 1970, the physical review split into ABCD, and uh, since then, of course, created a number of uh, additional successful journals. The most recent one being um, a highly selective open access journal on quantum information science and technology that. Uh, opened up a month ago. And so if you have such a big anniversary, of course, it's always a reason to look for and hopefully the next 50 years, but it's also an opportunity to look like, back at some of the seminal stuff that we have published. And to that end, one of the things that we're doing is we've launched a milestone connect that you can check out on the PRA website. Uh, features some of the uh, highlights that we've published over the last few Every two weeks a new paper will be added. Uh, so I'll encourage you to check that out. The uh, magazine also wrote a nice feature about three of those articles. And then the other thing is this seminar series. And uh, the idea, as the name behind the research suggests, is to do something a little bit different than normally in a seminar and to not talk so much about the physics or not only about the physics, but to pull back the curtain and, and look a little bit, give an idea of how the sausage was made. And so that's something that is maybe a non-angle. And with that, just a quick word on the proceedings for today. So we'll start our interview part that will be moderated by uh, Michel Rost. And then after that, in a second, we'll allow questions from everybody. If you would like to ask a question, please put them in the questions box in our control panel. And then we will select the questions afterwards and, and you can either read them or we will for you. And with that, I try to stop sharing my screen and uh, hand it over to you, Michael. Yeah, thank you very much, Thomas, for this nice introduction. And uh, let me welcome Marcek Levenstein and Michael Ivanov, two very distinguished theoretical scientists. Thank you Thank for you. having agreed to talk today about your famous paper on harmonic generation. But before we do oh. so, let me introduce you briefly to our audience. So Marcek Lebenstein leads the quantum optics theory group at the ICFO Institute, the Photonics Institute in Spain, near Barcelona, and he is also an ICREA professor there. He has extremely broad research interests, which are rooted in his early and persisting activities in quantum optics. His interests really range from ultra cold physics to quantum information, including fundamental questions of mathematical physics, all the way to statistical physics, where he is interested or was interested in disordered systems and spin glasses, which is essentially condensed matter topics but also neural networks and applications in cognitive science as well as social psychology. So he's a true scholar in the broadest sense, I would say. And of course, he has recurring interests in laser matter interaction, where topic-wise his most cited paper belongs to, which we will talk about today. And half of his over 600 publications, which is really quite impressive, 
magic, I didn't know that, appeared in the physical review, which is also impressive. So thank you for that. <laughs> and uh, so one third is roughly in PRL and uh, more than 200 in FISREF A itself. So let me come to Misha. Misha Ivanov is the head, as we heard already, of the theory department of the Max Born Institute. I oh, know we didn't hear this. We heard that he's professor at the Humboldt University in Berlin and also at Imperial College. But most of the time he spends actually at the Max Born Institute, where he heads a very vibrant theory group. And his interests are laser matter, laser matter interaction in the most broadest, most broad and general sense, I think. And that includes other second science, of course, and strong fields, basically embracing atomic physics, chemistry. I think this is where you come from, Misha, originally, and now condensed metaphysics. So Misha has been at the forefront of strong field physics for the last, I would say, two to three decades, significantly influencing and shaping other second science, as well as most recently applications with shaped intense laser pulses to condensed matter targets in questions of topology. The paper we are going to talk today about is also his most cited original research paper, only topped by the review about utter second physics he co-authored with Ferenc Krauss in 2009. And among his roughly, this might not be true because you're well hidden in the internet, Misha, about his 350 publications I identified, correct me if that's wrong, also, roughly half of them appeared in physical review. So also thanks to you for the trust in physical review. And uh, you have like, I think, uh, around 100 physical review letters and about 60 in, in FISREF A. So you're not so much trusting us in FISREF A, but still we are quite happy. <laughs> so I, 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 think, I think you didn't count my PRLs correctly. It's way too many. It's way too many. You, 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 you named way too many. I don't have so much. All right, all right. Thanks for, yeah, it might be true because I think there's a high energy guy, right? Who is also Misha. Okay, Ivo, it could be. And it's very hard to get rid of him. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> so we are celebrating today or this year the 50th anniversary of PISREF A, as Thomas already pointed out. And as already mentioned, it happens that you have published one of the most cited papers of PRA on the theory of harmonic generation. And certainly harmonic generation is the most important process, arguably coupling matter to light non-linearly. And uh, your paper, Theory of Harmonic Generation by Low Frequency Laser Fields, published in FISREF A in 1994, is instrumental to understand the fundamentals of harmonic generation. And I think this is clear if one reads the paper, and it's also certified by the many, many citations of the paper, I think more than 3,000. So I would even go so far, but you can contest this later on to claim that your approach is so simple yet accurate that it managed to trigger the creative thinking of many colleagues, including experimental colleagues. So it really laid the foundation for utter second science. And uh, what you wanted to achieve with this paper, as you state in the introduction, is to formulate a semi-classical approach for harmonic generation, which can build a bridge between the full quantum solution, which of course can be achieved and was already achieved back then for one active electron by solving the time-dependent Schrodinger equation. On the one hand side and on the other hand um, of the bridge is the intuitive but at best qualitative classical interpretation of the process, or at least mostly classical interpretation. So, so my first question for you is to let us know what, from your perspective, the most relevant points of your 1994 paper in PRA really are. Well, I think you have defined it very, very well. I think that the most uh, important thing was at that time uh, to understand the very fresh classical, I would say, or it's even not a good, good word, classical, but anyway, three-step model that Paul Korkum and Ken Kulander proposed to understand high harmonic processes, in, which consisted on three steps, which was tunneling, propagation of electron and laser field, and recombination to try to formulate it in a kind of consistent, self-consistent theory, which on one hand side gives this classical 
picture for electron propagating in the laser field, yet contains a lot of quantum effects, including quantum interference, spreading of wave packets, and things like that. And all that have, we have been able to achieve in a relatively simple means by solving in approximately way Schrodinger time dependent Schrodinger equation using what we call strong field approximation or other people call strong field approximation. So I think that I think this, in fact, the simplicity of this approach uh, was maybe one of the main uh, successes of, of this paper. I would say, I don't know. How. One thing that I maybe should add, we have been consequently, or I have been consequently calling this approach not semi-classical, but quasi-classical, because if you look at our um, an, um, settled point analysis of the quasi-classical action, it contains uh, complex trajectories because it includes the effect of quantum mechanical tunneling through the barrier which classically is forbidden. So in this sense, it's not semi-classical in the sense of Feynman integrals in which you really uh, uh, look for fluctuations of around the classical trajectory that minimize um, classical action, that uh, make classical action stationary, but rather it's something a little more complex. Mission. Well, uh, I have to say I agree with Maciek. Uh, I think uh, the most important part was that uh, we started with uh, something fully quantum and ended up, uh, thanks to the settle point analysis, with a um, trajectory picture. And the trajectories looked uh, almost classical, uh, apart from this uh, quantum part. Uh, which of course is very very important. That's that's the uh, quantum mechanical uh, aspect of uh, of tunneling, is, as as pointed out. I have to say that uh, personally, I wanted to get rid of the uh, quantum part as much as possible by uh, doing integration differently, staying on the real time axis. Uh, and that's okay uh, in the tunneling regime, but uh, in the multi photon regime, that doesn't work anymore. Uh, so, but, but this was very, very important. We really managed uh, to uh, take the three-step model, which was classical and sort of ad hoc. Uh, that's the one developed by Paul Korkum and Ken Kulander uh, and collaborators, uh, including Lou DiMaro, by the way, you should not forget, and Ken Schaefer, we should not forget. Um, absolutely, they have made very, very important contributions. and. We uh, translated this uh, into rigorous quantum language. Uh, also, what I should say is that uh, because of how the theory is formulated, it gives a very clear visual picture of how you can control uh, these uh, highly nonlinear processes. This is something that we used later uh, for. Uh, finding ways to generate data second pulses. I think that was very important. Well, I, I certainly thing. agree that this is quasi classical, right? I mean, it's totally clear also because you lack kind of the prefactor. You magically didn't need this. I mean, if you write asymptotically the path integral, then you have a prefactor and that you, yeah, you kind of could ignore more or less. And I think this is very interesting. This would lead to another question, which I even didn't want to ask you, but maybe we should just deviate from my script. Uh, so I think uh, because you were so successful for this with this paper, and it was so easy and transparent. People did not take up the full semi-classical kind of formulation of that until very recently, I think. So now in the last few years, I have seen a few publications where, where really full semi-classics is attempted. So why do you think that nobody tried to do this before? So what's what's the reason? Is it tunneling because it cannot be done or or because it was not necessary? And so let me ask you why why actually you do not need the amplitudes? <laughs> well, I don't know if Magic will answer in the same way. Uh, Magic, do you want to go first? No, no, now you first, please. Okay. So I uh, honestly, I, 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 I'm speaking from the heart. 
Uh, we did not need the prefactor because it's wrong anyway <laughs> in the strong field approximation. Apart from a very special case of a delta function potential and S state bound in this potential, you don't get it right anyway. Uh, and, and then, depending on how you formulate things, you uh, may or may not get it right, but there are ways of getting it right, and these ways actually require you to include the Coulomb potential, uh, and, and this is hard. Uh, and uh, in my personal view, uh, the real first good, satisfactory, fully self-consistent uh, way of doing it still simple enough to be tractable, not only by uh, highbrow theorists, but also by practical experimentalists, uh, is the analytical R matrix. And that was, uh, that started in 2007. The Coulomb potential is not easy to take care of. That's my yes, view. Yes, I absolutely agree with that this, uh, what we have been doing at, in the beginning of the 90s uh, simply was Still a very simple theory, which was capable of describing most of the experimental data, and it still is. Now, uh, I'm not sure if I understand your question correctly, Jan Michael, because uh, I think that at least in the groups that I know, the approach with semi-classics was always used in the 90s and, in the, and later, and later with Coulomb corrections even. So, uh, I don't know. Whereas, when we talk about prefactors, I mean, in the formulation of the strong field uh, uh, approximation that I was always propagating, the uh, Coulomb corrections are supposedly included in the continuum wave function, which nobody, of course, does properly because everybody takes Volkov function, but in principle, they are there. And the strong field approximation is the expansion in the most singular part of the continuous continuous dipole matrix element. This is how I see it. This is how you can formulate it. And the second paper that I wrote after this one, the famous one, was the paper with Ken Kulander, who at the time was in Chile, and we uh, applied the same theory to about threshold ionization uh, and uh, calculated corrections due to the rest scattering. So due to the less, so to say, singular part of the of the continuum continuum matrix element. This paper also has over 100 citations, and it's a kind of first of the papers, how to make this strong field in this way. Whether air matrix theory is the best or others are the best, I don't know. I always use my methods, and I'm happy with them. But uh, in this way, is also in this formulation, in a sense, of course, your um, uh, Feynman integral reduces to integral of uh, over something which has few variables, and therefore these prefactors of the corresponding uh, integration are there in concept. So it's, it's very simplified in a sense. Okay, so we are already you know in the usual theorist discussion, which is very nice, but we yeah. had in mind. <laughs> For, for this interview to take it a bit lighter, right? It's summer. So let me ask you, how did you actually write the paper? What's the story behind it? <laughs> Why think you should start first? Well, the, um, the, 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 first of all, there was a pre-paper. Uh, pre, uh, the first paper that we wrote together, when uh, we, there was a conference in uh, Belgium, very famous for the fact that the water mm, supply didn't work, so we had to drink beer all the time uh, for free uh, because there was no water. Uh, and in this, I think, conference, uh, the, uh, it was one of the first conferences where publicly this uh, three-step model was presented. And after this conference, I think Misha visited uh, me while I was at the time working in Sakla. And it stayed in my house even, no? I think so. Uh, not in... quite, Maciek. I, I, I spent quite a bit of time in your flat, but I stayed uh, in my you grand aunt's yeah. uh, house. Maybe, yes. <laughs> anyway, so we started to discuss this, and then we, we first formulated the famous landau dine formula or whatever for the dipole, time-dependent dipole moment, which is the essential formula used then by all the experimental groups from the famous paper. But the famous paper, in fact, I started to write 
alone when I was in Gila because I left Paris in, uh, I think, February 93. I went as a Gila visiting fellow for one year, and I was mostly working as a alone, exchanging, of course, the, whatever I was doing with Misha and with uh, Philippe Balcou and Anne Lullier, who were all uh, checking if I'm not doing some errors because the idea was to use all these Bessel functions and things that if I would try to do... Uh, boy, I hated Bessel functions, I can tell you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and then, uh, I mean, uh, Paul has entered the business at the very end, I would say, when the paper was, the shape of the paper was ready, but we invited him to yeah. be there because we, first of all, he was, Misha was then in the group of Paul, if I remember well, and uh, of course he was one of the really pioneers of this kind of theoretical approach and not only that. So this is how, how it was, okay. So that's, uh, that's pretty uh, much, I think, exactly uh, how it was on Maciek's side. I can probably add a few things how it was on my side. Uh, we were separated by, uh, by the ocean. Uh, and uh, as, as it is always the case with uh, Russians who are uh, let out of the, well, that time still Soviet Union. No, it was, it was 1992. No, there was no more Soviet Union. It was already Russia. I was let out and I was in Canada. Uh, and then um, I was, uh, of course, discussing a lot with Paul, the three-step model, and, and how you would take this classical uh, picture and uh, turn it into more quantitative calculation of harmonic generation, which uh, it really requires also the recombination step. Uh, so at that point in time, it was clear to me that uh, we have to populate Volkov states and then uh, somehow by tunneling and then compute uh, for the recombination from the, those states uh, to the ground state. So that was the, the thoughts that I had in mind. Uh, and after the conference in Belgium, uh, again, having a visit to Paris uh, and having an invitation to uh, come and talk about the three-step model, I, I used that opportunity. Uh, and then after I described, uh, I think it was in Saclay, I discussed, presented uh, what I thought about the three-step model, and Machi came and said, Misha, we can do it much better. And then he invited me for uh, to his flat. Uh, I remember I was very hungry, uh, and Machi was cooking fish, and it took forever. And I finished all of the sugar that you had uh, because I was so hungry. And then finally, <laughs> after after Magic fed me uh, with fish, he started to feed me with formulas. And and they were very nice. They were beautiful. Uh, and they were very different from what uh, I had in mind. I was thinking uh, in the uh, framework of Keldish approach more because Exactly. I, mean, yeah. I, I have to learn this by heart. <laughs> Uh, but Magic had his own way, and it was very beautiful. It was really elegant. I was really impressed. It was beautiful acrobatics in the evening in Paris. It was just wonderful. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, I came to Strongfield Approximation in the 80s. I'm much older than uh, Misha, and uh, in the 80s, the, the, I, I, I started to, to think about it because my supervisor at that time Kazik Zanzeski, who was before when he was young in uh, Trieste, was sharing the uh, room with Louis Davidovich, who was writing a paper, I think, with Nusselt Feig on, on Keldish approximation. And this preprint of this paper was in my hands in 1984 or something like that. And I was fascinated by the fact that, uh, that uh, this uh, Bessel function suddenly appear and everything is analytic and started to work at that time on, on this or think about it. And one of the things that also appeared in the 80s, which was very important, was the first observation of the ATI, which was in several groups in particular. We were particularly impressed at that time by the Van der Veel uh, experiments in POM. And uh, uh, because the spectrum was maybe the nicest, although Agostini probably was uh, earlier. Um, and the, um, 
the the theories that people started to propose for this were theories in which they started to use continuum continuum matrix element and transitions in the continuum. The first paper that I was, uh, so to say, uh, confronted with was by Zofia Piaviniska Birula uh, from the Institute of Physics in Warsaw, and uh, soon after, very similar approach was developed and published in Physical Letters by Eberly and his uh, and his people. And then I started to think how to connect the scale this with continuum continuum matrix elements. And I wrote some stupid and completely forgotten papers and I published them unfortunately in the Institute of Physics Journal of Physics B. And not in physics. <laughs> <laughs> but that was 87 or something. And then I came to Sakla and they started to uh, first experimentally started to tell me all the fascinating story about high harmonics and what the hell is happening. And then Misha explained me the classical thing and then we connected somehow. But of course also it's worth saying that this paper, if this paper had been written by Misha Ivanov and Maciej Levenstein and just published in PISREF A, it probably would have been forgotten like many other theoretical papers. It is the fact that Anne Lullier and Paul Corcum were on this paper and started to use this theory in their groups and their experiments. And because they were leading experimentalists, the other experimental groups started to do the same. And that's why this paper has so many, uh, is so useful, I think. I don't know if you agree, Misha, but. I completely agree. I, I think it was very, very important that it was related uh, so directly uh, to experiments, and and uh, there is, there is a proof to your statement, Maciek, because uh, 1991, I think, uh, Wilhelm Becker and John McIver wrote a paper on high harmonic generation from a delta function potential, and uh, there is no mistake in that paper. It's fully correct and describes the same thing, and it's totally yeah. forgotten. And maybe, uh, maybe what also mattered uh, in my mom, this is my view, is that we really connected uh, to the classical uh, mechanics using the settle point, and, and, and that really made the bridge. Because there is another paper that I must mention, uh, and it is reasonably well cited, but it's not cited enough. That's Atomic Antenna. It's a beautiful work by oh, Misha yeah, which yeah. is again completely ignored but you, you should really take the abstract and read the abstract yeah, it yeah. says in black and white very so similar things so the difference is made by this connection let's say in your I case so. experimentalists who carry this on I so think that the, almost advice to young postdocs to kind of connect to experiments and try to develop things together at least for a while well, or at least uh, when you write a very complicated and beautiful and elegant theory, then try to translate it into a language understandable by a broad audience of experimentalists. I'm not trying to, you know, insult experimentalists at all. <laughs> but, but they are making effort to, to allow us to understand the experiment. So we should make similar effort to help them understand our formula. So Absolutely. is there something you would write differently today if you look back? I mean, you, you've done so much in between, right? And so what would you write differently in this paper? Oh. Well, I think the, uh, I personally would have used uh, my favorite formalism of Magic has his own. They're equally nice. I like them both. Um, everything else, uh, I wouldn't change. Fewer I mean, best you are I mean, this, uh, uh, the best part of this paper uh, is the uh, introduction, first chapter, how we introduce strong field uh, yes. uh, theory and then the uh, subtle point analysis. And then there are these uh, analytic Gaussian models, which take like five pages, okay, which everybody was using because they were useful and they were analytic. They're, they're full of Bessel function and beautiful and elegant, as Misha says, but whether, if I would write it today, whether I would spend time to do it, probably not, because I, I know already that there are more important things that to have be expressed in Gaussian, uh, in Gaussian <laughs> and things like that. So there are things, yeah. On the other hand, we wrote, uh, Misha was not on the paper, but we wrote a huge 
review on strong field approximation on the occasion of 25 years of this paper, in a sense, which we published in reports on progress on physics by, I don't know, 20 authors from different groups because we had a, a grant which was called Symphonia, Polish actually, grant Symphonia, Symphony. So the paper is called Symphony on SFA. Uh, and the, I think I have copy pasted part of the, of the uh, more or less part of the uh, PRA paper or one uh, to explain how do we, how do we form, can formulate a strong field approximation. So in this sense, part of the text, I wouldn't change anything. But as I think, I'm not using his favorite method. I mean, mine is a little different. <laughs> Uh, that's okay. So let me repeat my question from the introduction. Would you go so far that you would say you, you mentioned this kind of close interaction or you know good influence, let's put it this way, on the experimental colleagues because they could actually relate to this theoretical formulation and kind of do something with it. Would you go so far as I did to say that this three-step model and your formulation of it has essentially enabled utter second science in the sense that it really provided the insight to build and design uh, high harmonic uh, laser sources. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yes. No, no, no doubt about it. Look, I didn't uh, expect anything else. No, it's okay. But I think no, so but too. Look, it's very yes, that's what I did. From the so, formula, sorry, Martin. From the formula that you get for this time dependent dipole moment. You, you get it in a form of a complex quantity, which has a phase. And this phase depends on this quasi-classical action. And therefore, uh, already from that, you can, uh, you, you can understand a lot of properties of the harmonics, including the behavior of harmonics in propagation in the medium. But uh, the, the most important maybe thing that you get is that this phase of the uh, Fourier component of this dipole moment are in phase. So they, if something oscillates with uh, harmonic frequencies and has the same phase, as you know, this produces very short pulses. So immediately in 95, we already knew that simple harmonic generation in the long uh, pulses of 100 femtoseconds or something like that will produce at a second pulse strain. And it was Krauss who was crazy from the beginning to make a single, or also to make a single at a second pulse. But of course, the first observation, the simplest was in long laser pulses in which the at a second pulse strain was observed by Pierre Agostini. Yeah, I would add to this uh, a little bit. Um... Because if, if you look at uh, time-resolved uh, dipole produced by a single atom, uh, it doesn't look like a train of other second pulses unless you filter out uh, yeah. the, the highest filter, energy yeah. part, Absolutely. the very highest energy oh, part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. And but you also but what is important, uh, I think, is, is that um, it, it tells you everything that you need to know, to find a way uh, to make short pulses either by filtering the highest energy part or by, for example, using the time dependent ellipticity so that you blow the electron sideways during most of the pulse except to, for the very, very short uh, interval. Uh, or you can combine fundamental and second harmonic and change the relative phase between the two. And all of these uh, ideas, they really evolved uh, from uh, this three-step model uh, and from the quantum formulation. Mm -hmm. And especially I want to stress what Machik said, uh, that uh, you get the harmonic phases from this uh, uh, quantum formulation, and this allows you uh, to understand that so-called short trajectories and long trajectories uh, do not propagate in the same way in the medium. And once in a while, this is a very rare occasion, nature is kind to you and it kills uh, long trajectories and only short trajectories survive because of their phase properties uh, and phase matching issues. And, and, and that, of course, you can also get from the semi-classical uh, model if you can just add the classical uh, action to the phase. But it was immediately there, present in, uh, in uh, the work that Machik and I did.
Yes. Yeah. So thanks a lot. So would you agree to start to take some questions, maybe? So Absolutely. you know, if there's a break in the questions, I have some more for you, but maybe it would be nice to let the audience participate and start to think about questions. Thomas, do we have some questions? Yes, I have one. Before I read the questions, I can't resist a personal comment uh, since March vessel functions everywhere. I have to say I'm used to the expression of uh, tedious but elimination, but your paper is the only one where I've ever read something about complicated but elementary calculations. I'm not, I'm not <laughs> sure what that is. About. <laughs> yes. <laughs> anyway. We have one question, uh, Tom, and he says, uh, I'd be interested in your view of semi-classical methods for an qualitative and calculating harmonic generation in solids. Ah, no. they're great. They're great. There is, there is actually a, a very, very uh, neat paper that is on the archive. Uh, uh, with Thomas Brabitz as one of the co-authors, and that's a theory paper. Uh, and then there is a recent nature paper by Lifterius Gulimakis, uh, and uh, that's experimental paper with uh, uh, some theory in it. And they really very strongly push and advocate uh, the semi-classical perspective in real space, uh, and using Vanya, localized Vanya functions uh, as basis set. So, so that's that's very, very neat. Absolutely. So, first of all, one should say that solid state, uh, strong fields, strong laser fields applied to solid the systems is now a very hot subject and harmonics in one of, one of those. In the simplest situation, uh, you can use the so-called semiconductor uh, Bloch equation to describe uh, the harmonic generation for interband emission, the formulas that you get are exactly the same that we get uh, with Misha, except that the energy in the continuum is, of course, given by the dispersion in the solid and things like that. But you can analyze them with the help even of the trajectories. However, the best approach for that is, as Misha mentioned, is to describe the, at least the, uh, how do you call it, balance band in the Vanier description, because then you have localized electrons in the um, uh, initial state, and then you can talk about trajectories in the real space. There is one paper about it that my group wrote in uh, phys Physical Radio X in 2017, and there is a new beautiful paper by, uh, I don't know who's the first paper, the, who is the first author, but I think Paul Horton is on that. Yeah, there is, uh, there, is uh, well, there was a paper by Julia Vampa, a first author, uh, and that's a few years ago, uh, which basically uh, realized the same program, the same uh, quasi-classical program in two-band system. Uh, we use it all the time, I have to say. Uh, we don't publish in Fisrafe anymore. We only publish in Nature journals, I'm sorry. <laughs> but we will fix good. that. <laughs> uh, but but this, is, this is, of course, something that we use uh, analytically but also numerically, our code uh, to uh, calculate harmonic generation in multiple band solids actually are propagating Vanya orbitals. Uh, and, and, but they're still working in momentum space and uh, that's the next step to convert everything into real space. Uh, this would be very, very useful. Yeah, so if I may add to that, so one complication certainly in solids is dephasing and decoherence, right? That's that has been for quite a while. So how would you so, do that, and how could that be incorporated in a proper way? Aha, uh -huh. uh, Jan Michel, you're asking a very good question. I can tell you how we do it now, uh, but it is probably not how I would want to do it analytically. Uh, so uh, now we're uh, running density matrix and we are simply uh, introducing uh, uh, relaxation the time and dephasing time by hand. Uh, what uh, we could do, uh, and this would need to be done analytically, for analytics that's possible, uh, we could uh, introduce uh, random phase uh, uh, modulations 
uh, into continuum or, or into the electron motion and the conduction band. So we would, I think, we can stay within the wave function formalism, but uh, add random phases. So this is what I, this is the program I would like to implement. Use uh, wave formalism, but and the localized basis set, and then uh, introduce uh, scattering sideways, which reduces the return amplitude the recollision or recombination amplitude, and introduce phase modulations uh, using the Akanal Volkov approach. Mm -hmm. well, we essentially do the, do the same at this moment. So in the in the equation, whatever they are, this kind of multiband block equations, we, we write them for the density matrix and then introduce the phasing time in the uh, in the dipole yeah. transition moment. Uh, usually taking its values from the experiment. Okay, very similar thing we do now for the uh, generation from uh, high TC superconductors. Okay, but there uh, again we can only do it. And there the situation is uh, interesting because the, this dephasing is mostly caused by the electron and holes which are not in the superconductor. But they are, they are sort of saying, flowing normally, and they have resistance. But the more serious theory is very complicated for this, and I, I don't I don't really know. I'm not sure if, for instance, the phonon effects are uh, phonon effects at least in some situation probably play a uh, very important role. And to, so to have an ab initio something about this is like. Hard, yeah. anyway, probably Hard. difficult. Yes. Hard. Probably very important and very beautiful, but but very. Uh, mm -hmm. Thomas, do we have more questions? Yeah, or? we have one follow-up question from Uber, uh, but then we'll switch. Somebody, uh, I remember a paper of yours using vanier states to assess whether the rescattering viewed classically is good for solid high harmonic generations. Did you follow up on that? And with regard to the SPE, how do you justify and what would you suggest for phenomenological dephasing? Uh, the first question is that we didn't follow up on that paper in the sense that uh, uh, Misha is, uh, was mentioning. Misha is doing much more in this direction. Uh, but the, the, currently, we are working, uh, working quite a lot of on related problems and we are using this Vanier approach. You see that, I mean, I should maybe say, I have the European Research uh, Council grant, which is called Nokia, which means uh, uh, Novel Quantum Simulators. And it is supposed to discuss simulations of strong field physics with ultra cold atoms and vice versa. So you and if you think about the shaking or modulating of the uh, optical lattice in which atoms sit is very similar, is equivalent in the sense of Hamiltonian to the oscillating laser field. Okay, and then you can have connections between the strongly correlated system of atoms in optical lattices and multi insulators in solid state, which are driven by strong laser field. So in this sense, we permanently work on this problem. So that was the first question. The second was, how would I do what? Argue the about... SP, how do you justify and what value would you suggest for phenomenological time? Ah, from the experiment. I mean, the, I talk to experimentalists and they give me something. I mean, I talk about that. That's wrong. I feed my uh, harm generated harmonic to the part of the spectrum in which, say, in high temperature, where I can, and then I have this thing, and then I, and then I do phenomenological theory that I assume that this damping is, in, uh, let's say, in the case of this uh, superconductors, it's a strange metal for low temperatures, so it uh, depends linearly on temperature and things like that. So I do phenomenological fits, yes, starting from uh, high temperature. And that this, I think, can be always done if you compare with experiments. Audience is a bit short. Sorry. No, go. No, the results of this high harmonic generation for this kind of models depend 
very strongly on this equation. It's very crucial yeah. para parameter. Yeah, yeah. The the main problem is that uh, the phenomenological constants uh, that we put in uh, have very little to do with reality, at least in in our case, not in uh, high temperature superconductors or superconductors. In our case, uh, and and um, they are uh, really uh, a simple man's attempt uh, to incorporate. Um, with as little effort as possible, macroscopic effect, high her harmonic generation. Uh, because what is really happening is that, uh, like in atoms, uh, short trajectories and long trajectories uh, behave differently and propagate differently. In solids, we have many very, very long trajectories with, with very complex phases, and, they, uh, and we need to kill them. And one way to kill them is by doing a proper propagation uh, calculation. And there is only one, well, there are very, very few people in the world who can do this. Uh, Meta Garden Company, uh, uh, Joachim Burgdorfer and Company, and Mira Kalesikan Company. And these are truly heroic uh, calculations by truly heroic people. Uh, uh, what we do is just kill these long trajectories by introducing very, very short relaxation times. And we fully understand that this is uh, really fitting, but uh, well, what can we do? Yeah, thanks yeah. a lot. That's how I would see that, but <laughs> yeah, but I think this is that's an interesting question, right? From a certain perspective, to be simple, to attract newcomers to the field, that's a very how to say justified and legitimate uh, way to do this, right? Right, because. As you say, there's only a few groups who have the ability to do this microscopically. So what's the point then in order to make progress? So one could ask the question, you know, how is progress more uh, actually uh, achieved by doing that way you do it right now? You describe it by including phenomenological basically elements yeah. or by trying to solve the problem fully. You need and both. The 1994 paper proved um, that, you know, Simple approach is possible yet actually to the system, to the reality that is very successful. So, so yeah, I mean, you need both. Yeah. Uh, what I'm saying, I'm trying to say that you really need both. Uh, you need uh, clear physics and you also need to uh, eventually do the hard part. Uh, and, and, uh, whether it could be the same person who does uh, simple physics and then bites the bullet and does the hard part, this depends. Uh, and you can also do something in between. You can uh, simplify very, very complex calculations by having clear physical insight, uh, which is informed by simple models, and then you gradually improve. And that's the, the route that we are taking, at least. And, and that certainly is that Machik was taking when uh, uh, he was writing his papers on, on the high harmonics, for sure. For sure. Yes. So this That's brings true. me maybe almost to, to not a final question, but maybe to, you know, switch the gear a little bit. And that is basically a more broader perspective. Where, where do you see the field of strong physics moving to? What's, what's to come? Where to go? I let Magic answer first so that I have a chance to think. Uh, I mean, the solids that we mentioned, I think this is the, one of the most uh, in, interesting directions for many reasons. Uh, first of all, combining it with the nanostructures and all this kind of stuff, which was already discussed since 2008, maybe that nanostructure can enhance harmonics, and things like that. There was a lot of controversies there, but there are people like Kling, like um, several people in experiments who do work with nanostructures. There are people who work with topological materials, so you can uh, study the thought. This is Misha's papers and things like that. We also wrote one paper about this kind of thing. So you can study topology by applying strong laser pulses, but you can also, um, there is a paper now in uh, in the archives that we wrote, but of course there are experiments by um, 
what's his name, Cavalieri in Hamburg, that if you apply circularly polarized, in this case, I guess it were Terracell's laser or something like that, you can induce a transient uh, topological uh, floquet insulator or whatever, uh, or churn insulator, if you like. And uh, so applying structured laser field, which is a new field again, in which both Misha and my group are very active, applying this kind of fields to solid state, you can maybe create God knows what, God knows what uh, interesting effects and, and things like that, including this transient superconductivity, maybe topological superconductivity, all the plethora of phenomena, uh, phenomena is possible in my opinion with this, if you think it globally. So on one side, nanostructured topological materials, on the other side, topological laser fields and things like that. I think this yeah. is a fascinating uh, encounter and this will be a lot of things happening in the next slide. Yeah, Maciek is completely right. I second this opinion fully. Um, so we have this unique opportunity that we can structure light locally, uh, which means that we can shape polarization of the laser beam uh, in principle in three dimensions. And uh, we can structure light globally uh, using the structured light. And uh, this is a new tool that we can uh, use on uh, solid and and uh, our papers uh, just accepted that will be uh, it's coming out uh, it is on the archive uh, it's called uh, uh, topological strong field physics or something like this uh, where we use tailored uh, light beams to uh, induce topological phase transition in a trivial uh, insulator uh, and uh, in contrast to previous work on flaquet topological uh, structures. Uh, this one is real-time, real-space picture, and that's very useful. I actually think that would be very uh, useful for experimentalists. And the second field uh, that, that I believe is very, very important is using structured light, structured locally and uh, on chiral systems, and that's uh, something that uh, is pursued by uh, uh, Olga Smirnova in uh, at the Max Born Institute. I think that's, that's really, really fascinating uh, that you can uh, achieve uh, situations where a left-handed molecule uh, gives you very strong nonlinear optical response, and the right-handed molecule remains dark. Uh, completely dark. It's it's absolutely wonderful, and you do it by shaping light uh, in three dimensions, locally and globally. And this is this is very very important. I think that's that's really cool. Yeah. I think that the second physics, strong field physics is beginning to realize uh, it's, a new its promise. Era. It's a new era. I mean, you remember? Our, it's a new era. In 1993, where we were trying to publish our first paper with the famous uh, uh, Landau-Dinner formula for dipole moment, it was there was a rumor that George Basbas, uh, at that time chief editor of Physical Letters, said that no more papers about harmonic. This subject is finished. This is not there is nothing in it. 93, all right. 93. And of course, the paper was, was rejected, by the way, Maciek. Our, our first version was, was rejected, rejected from PRL. This paper was rejected from PRL, was published again in Physical Review A, <laughs> and the rapid communication. And uh, uh, what I want to say, and there was a new era, and I think the similar new era now comes with all this uh, yes. combination of all the structures in solid, in nanostructures, and the structures in light. It's a new 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 thing and it will be evidently very very hard and useful i'm sure it will be useful so i mean you've got an extreme mileage with single electron kind of description right in the let's say in the old era basically everything is more or less built on single electron description will this also be possible in the new era for solid state no. targets no right no of course i mean if you talk about Shining later on strongly correlated system, no. If you have yeah. strong correlations, you need to think. And of course, there are approaches which are maybe uh, at least 
let's say moderate correlations you can include using time dependent R before or time dependent functional theories or things like that. But for the true stuff, you will have, I don't know, exactly time dependent exact simulation using tensor network codes or things like that. I have no idea, which is only possible for small systems anyway. So, but, uh, but this is what we will need, yes. Well, we're moving actually in this direction uh, together with Sasha Lichtenstein uh, uh, using uh, dynamical mean field theory for strongly correlated systems. It's a it, it's it's a horrendously complicated uh, calculation, horrendously complicated uh, method. But the physics that comes out is actually very simple and elegant, and it's more or less one electron, uh, except that it's not one electron but one effect particle. And what I hope yeah. for is that if we're clever enough, we would map uh, this many body Hamiltonians onto something where there is an effective uh, single particle uh, behavior. Uh, but of course, that's a strongly correlated behavior. And then we could understand it somehow. Otherwise, uh, we have to bow to uh, very serious condensed method theorists who have been doing strongly correlated systems for all their life. Uh, we'll have to cross the corridor from your office, Jan Michel, <laughs> to your co-director <laughs> in Dresden and PI. On the other hand, in the ultra cold business, we are, doing right this. <laughs> we are doing this. So we are uh, writing papers about strongly correlated systems. Of course, they are uh, corresponding to the uh, 100,000 atoms in the lattice of uh, 100 times 100, or maybe 10,000 atoms, right? Uh, but uh, uh, so uh, the co contemporary quantum optics is not uh, no more a single atom, single photon uh, theory. It's a many body theory, quantum theory of strongly correlated systems also. So uh, yes, but the time dependence adds additional complication to everything. And there are methods, as Misha mentioned, dynamical uh, mean field theory is probably one of the best. But all of them, which are based on some kind of mean field approaches, uh, fail to describe entanglement and strong uh, quantum correlations very often because they are built. Like they are built. So it's really a very tough problem. For this, this is the challenge for all the areas of physics, including, of course, also high energy physics because the strong correlations happen there. there. Also, so gentlemen, the hour is almost full. <laughs> so I have from my side one last question we always ask in the interest, of course, also of the audience. And that is, what is your advice to a young postdoc who dreams to leave a mark in science and become a big professor like you guys have become? <laughs> I know what I would say. <laughs> Work <Whoa>. hard. <laughs> yeah, but luck is necessary also. Yeah. I mean, luck, one, of, yes. uh, one thing that we didn't uh, say about the paper that we discussed today is that also you should the right things in the right time. Yeah. And we did it. Yeah. And that's why poor uh, paper of Becker or Wilhelm Becker or the mentioned paper about antennas or the paper of Elotsky, which has the same formula, which were earlier, they were maybe not done in the right place. The right. So luck is necessary, but I mean, if you don't work in string theory, then do work on something that is directly connected to experiment. I'm sorry. Always think about it. There is elegance in theoretical physics. There is importance of mathematical structure fantastic and you fantastic. should develop this and things like that but always think about experiment whether what you calculate can be measured yeah i agree i lived my life in experimental groups so i cannot disagree me too my career is because at some moment i went to Zakla and worked with amul yeah and pascal Salier. Yes. okay so if you don't have to say anything as of last words for this webinar, 
then I would like to thank you very much for this entertaining hour. But I think we also had a few more insights, especially this connection to experiment from eminent theoreticians. I think <laughs> it's really a good lesson also for our younger kind of uh, listeners and watchers. So thanks again for your time. Misha, have a good thank time you. in France going on. And I certainly will. I'm going to swim. The water, unfortunately, today is 17 degrees. There was Mistral yesterday. 17, all right. <laughs> but other than that, it's great. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, bye thanks bye. for being here. Magic, it was great seeing you. It was great seeing it you, was gentlemen. Great, yes. I will apply air matrix theory now. <laughs> <laughs> No, for what? All right. I promise I will. <laughs> bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh...